again with a hearing from the second panel. Um, this morning I'd like to introduce uh, Miss Kathy Martin. She's the president of Monroe County Farm Bureau. And Mr. Jonathan Taylor, he's the owner of Oak Ridge Dairy. And lastly, Mr. John Teeple, who is the owner of Teeple Farms. Welcome uh, this morning to our hearing. Um, it is the custom of Oversight and Government Reform Committee to swear in our um, panelists. So if you would please stand, raise your right hand. Do you sw solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much. Ms. Martin, if we could start with you with your testimony. And again, thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. I appreciate your time and consideration on these important matters to agriculture. My name is Kathy Martin, and I'm the office administrator for John B. Martin and Son Farms. We're a 3,000 acre fruit and vegetable farm and have a small on-farm processing operation for cabbage and winter squash. Both our cabbage and squash operations are labor intensive and we require approximately 100 employees on a seasonal basis and 40 full-time employees. My job has oversight of all aspects of office procedures for the efficient day-to-day -day running of our farm. In the past few years, the most difficult and time-consuming aspect of my job has been working to acquire legal employees from the federal H-2A visa program. I'm here today before you to discuss the regulatory impediments to job creation in the Northeast. New York has become one of the most heavily taxed and regulated states in the U.S., and many farms are struggling to stay in business. With all the complications that are currently endured, short growing seasons, extreme and unpredictable weather, and labor shortages, it continues to become more difficult to keep farms in business with the constant addition of new regulations. Among these regula regulatory impediments is that of the H-2A program, the Agricultural Guest Worker Visa Program. This program is intended to supplement farms with foreign labor when there is a domestic labor shortage. However, the complications within the program have largely increased, growing to a level that is causing the program to become unusable. The H-2A program was created in 1987 and was not updated until 2008 when the Bush administration made changes that helped growers by streamlining the application process and making the program easier for farmers to use. However, with the new administration coming forward in 2009, these changes were quickly reversed and an even harsher environment for using the program was created with excessive time delays and paperwork burdens. While immigration issues have become a growing concern across the nation, agriculture still needs access to reliable, stable, legal workforce through a federal guest worker program. It is vital to my farm that when my application is submitted for use of the H-2A program, that there is a consistency, accuracy, and timeliness in execution of the program and process. At this point, there are different interpretations of the program rules, and this has made compliance increasingly difficult. While I understand there must be proper paperwork and documentation in this process, when I specify a date of need for my workers on the application, it is often overlooked and not met, met by the U.S. Department of Labor. These extreme delays have caused a loss, of, uh, loss in my crops as workers have not been available to plant, pick, or do essential work on the farm that is crucial to staying in business. Processing problems have repeatedly occurred at the National Processing Center in Chicago. Within the past year, there has been an abnormally large number of deficiencies and denials of H-2A certificates. Many of the deficiencies and denials have involved requests for experienced workers within specific employee classifications of a job order, reference requirements, temporary and seasonal work, and a differing interpretation based on prevailing practices, surveys that are conducted by the State Department of Labor with inconsistent results. These difficulties cause delay in the process and force farmers in desperate need of workers to engage in costly, stressful, and time-consuming administrative appeals. This is a huge burden on the farmer, especially when most of these appeals have been ruled in favor of the farmer. When an employer is filing their H-2A job order, there are sections that include a description of the employee's job duties. Also included is a section stating the level of experience required to be able to sufficiently complete the job description. These types of employee requirements can vary from farm to farm and depend on numerous factors. The farm is able to provide more training, therefore they are able to lower the amount of experience required by the farmer. Different modes of production vary from farm to farm and not all requirements are the same. 
For example, when apples are picked for fresh market, it requires more experience and delicacy than when apples are picked for processing. And similar to other job qualifications outside of farming, there are times when a job description may have different requirements from year to year. Job expectations can change, and farms should be allowed to determine what is necessary on their farm. However, when applications are sent through, the regulatory requirements of this program force farms into a one-size-fits-all scheme. That makes it extremely difficult for my farm to fulfill requirements for the application process and ensure that we will have access to labor that will accurately and safely complete the job order. Farmers must advertise for workers in three separate states to demonstrate that they cannot find domestic labor. Advertisements in newspapers must be for a specific number of days and on specific days of the week. This advertising adds expense and time to the application process. Farmers seldom recruit domestic workers through this process and almost never from further away than the local area, even given the recent high rates of unemployment. While I understand that the need of foreign workers must be demonstrated to access the program, these advertising requirements must be adjusted to be a procedure that actual employers would reasonably undertake with an ability to recruit potential domestic workers. At its current level, the recruitment, the recruitment requirements are unrealistic. The regulatory process of the H-2A program also creates problems with its restrictive definitions and limited use of program for certain industries within agriculture. Dairy and other livestock farmers who have a year-round rather than a seasonal need for labor are not able to access the program because they are not included in the agricultural employment definition. However, they face the same challenges in recruiting reliable workers as fruit and vegetable farms. Additionally, farmers cannot use H-2A workers for incidental employment. On my farm, there are a large variety of tests that must be done to keep the operation running. It is unrealistic to expect one worker to only complete one task throughout his or her entire employment period. Coupled with illnesses or days off for other employees, at times there are situations that require workers to pick up ex extra tasks to get the needed jobs done. Allowing H-2A workers to do these incidental tasks while employed by a farm would be extremely helpful in our common sense. Expanding these definitions will allow for a stronger and more efficient use of workers during their, their employment, while at the same time creating a stronger workforce on the farm. Prevailing practice surveys are distributed yearly by each state in the United States, as required by the H-2A program, to farmers based on their commodity asking detailed questions about farm practices and labor experience. These surveys have caused complications at both the state and the U.S. Departments of Labor as a survey develops a standard farm employment and allows applications to be denied if farms deviate from the norm. It is not appropriate to determine that all agricultural operations will have standard needs across an entire state. Every farm is unique and will have different requirements and job positions in its application depending on its needs. All of these factors, including others, have caused great complication within the H-2A system through the past years and specifically over the past three years. The regulatory burdens that complicate this program have hindered job creation, not helped, to create a usable workforce within agriculture. While farms utilize all attempts possible to bring in domestic workers, there comes a point when the H-2A program becomes crucial to gaining foreign workers. If we don't have a reliable workforce in agriculture to plant, pick, cultivate and tend to animals, then our farms will not survive and job creation throughout New York and the U.S. will fail. For every one job on a farm, there is a ripple effect that creates three more jobs off the farm. With coordination, these are problems that can be fixed to create a usable guest worker program for agriculture. As these pro problems are fixed, farms will be able to spend more time directly working with their employees and tending to the crops and animals. This opens up opportunities for a strong business environment and a successful workforce on my farm and off the farm as well. I look forward to working with the committee on these important issues. I truly appreciate the opportunity to express these concerns with you and hope to continue this dialogue in the future. During a time of such economic concern, it is important to discuss the potential for a stronger, more reliable agricultural sector, which in turn will create jobs in all parts of the economy and help our recovery. Uh, thank you for the time to discuss these regulatory impediments and job creation and potential solutions that could be addressed to lessen the burdens. Thank you, Mrs. Martin. Mr. Taylor? Uh, good morning, and thank you for inviting me to testify before you here today. 
I, I, I'm before you as a dairy farmer and a representative of the New York Farm Bureau Board of Directors, the state's largest general farm organization with nearly 30,000 farmer family, family members. I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer and agriculture has fundamentally changed since my father's generation. More than ever, family farms must recognize and adapt to the generations, this generation's new realities. The volatility in the global marketplace, increasing energy costs, and relentless regulatory burden. Whether as a blunt sledgehammer or a micromanaging guardian, overzealous regulation is killing our family farms, depriving it of any potential for growth and eroding our local food infrastructure. Without question, producers of all sizes and sectors identify the myriad of regulatory stresses from the federal and state level as the number one obstacle to business growth, profitability, and in some cases, business survival. Government mandates have become tangible barrier to our farm families being able to pass their business on to the next generation as they compete with foreign competitors who do not have to tolerate such rigorous and costly regulations. No one wants lesser food quality from questionable sources like China. But with the diminishing number of farms in New York State, due to the hostile regulatory climate, who will be left standing to fill the food gap? If food security, public health, and accessibility to local, nutritious, high-quality foods are federal priorities, then something must be done to rein in the many regulations that demand extremely high compliance costs for family farms with very little environmental, public health, or any other beneficial gains. New York's family farms are experiencing an unprecedented level of federal regulatory agency oversight in the sectors of environmental management, labor, and food safety. Much of this regulatory activity is being seen in the form of broad-based mandates that do not take into account existing federal and state regulatory and voluntary programs and their success in the field. While simplistic in theory and implementation, these mandates are counterproductive and a waste of limited resources of farmers, taxpayers, and government agencies. For example, the original draft of the Chesapeake TMDL would have discounted the progressive best management practices that farmers have installed to the state's agricultural and environmental management programs and replaced them with less effective, more expensive protocols that work against New York's unique landscape and agricultural traits. In the last six months alone, New York Farm Bureau has in invested a great deal of time and resources on a number of regulatory and agency policies that competitively will drive New York family farms out of business. For example, the Chesapeake TMDL, NRCS Code Standard 590, Greenhouse Gas Regulations, Duplicative Pesticide Permit under the Clean Water Act, FDA Milk Sampling Assignment, Web-Based Pesticide Labeling, Protection of Dairy Product Identity, Exclusion of Certain Vegetables from School Lunch Programs. Today I will address three of the most urgent issues. The EPA has brought agriculture industry on a tent scrutiny for its environmental sustainability. Continually improving water quality and the environmental cons conservation is a paramount priority for New York farmers. While we support the EPA's intent of improving the waters here in New York and nationwide, we do feel that the reasoning and methodology and development and implementation of certain regulations lack a foundation in sound science and ignore inherent state-specific factors that will influence compliance like seasonality and topography. These regulations also fail to produce any environmental gain outside of what already has been achieved through alternative, less costly means that have proven to be equally effective. I offer the following examples. To improve and restore the water quality in the Chesapeake Bay, the EPA developed a regulatory framework called the Total Maximum Daily Load, or TMDL, for New York and the other five states whose waters enter into the Chesapeake Bay. Yet, the EPA's Ches draft TMDL was inequitable, unattainable, and threatened the livelihood of the nearly 900 farms in New York and the Chesapeake Bay area without markedly improving the water quality for the Bay. The EPA's proposed TMDL imposes disproportionately stringent restrictions and requirements on New York's farm industries that would cost millions of dollars in order to keep other states to meet their total TMDL goal. If inter intervention was not made by New York Farm Bureau, other partners, and our congressional delegation in the final TMDL, the farm community would have seen small farms put out of business, and those remaining would have seen large increase in costs, staff, time, and red tape to, to adhere to the restrictions. The NRCS practice standards provide a suite, a suite of tools for farm site-specific solutions for sustainable environmental management. In the past, these guidelines documents, guidance documents were usually found on practical science-based approaches that do not place unburdened on our farm families. NRCS stepped away from this philosophy and several policy revisions that abandoned scientific justification in place of a one-size-fits-all mandate. Particularly, New York Farm Bureau strenuously opposes the NRCS proposal 
of an implement a national calendar ban on nutrient spreading on farms of all sizes and management levels. A one-size-fits-all federal practice standard cannot replicate nutrient use efficiencies, optimum crop response, and environmental gain that Cornell University on-farm research and trials results have provided to New York farmers to inform their farm management and business planning decisions. New York Farm Bureau requests that the committee intervene with NRCS to withdraw its overreaching policy. Greenhouse gases. The EPA is also using authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate greenhouse gases. Dairy farms with 25 cows or more would be considered a major source of emissions, forced to pay an annual permitting fee of $175 per cow. The average dairy size in New York is 100 cows. So we have more than 3,300 dairy farms in New York State that would have to pay this tax under the EPA's greenhouse gas ruling. EPA itself estimates that 37,000 farms nationwide would be impacted at an average annual fee of $23,000. In New York, we have farms that we pay in excess yearly of $300,000 for this tax. It's really difficult, if not impossible, for farmers to control the amount of emissions from their animals. A natural process, so this regulation is equivalent to a cow tax penalty just for growing food. This kind of regulation by the EPA on farms is not going to provide a positive impact on greenhouse gas in this country. Instead, it's going to be another barrier, another expense for farmers like myself who are just trying to put milk or other food on the table. Another barrier for our farmers facing duplicative pesticide permitting structure that EPA has been forced into by a court decision in January 2009. This ruling forces applicators to get a national pollutant discharge elimination system permit under the Clean Water Act in addition to the usual Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodicide Act, or FIFRA. Previously, pesticides governed by FIFRA were exempt from regulation under the CWA because they go through extensive testing before they are allowed into the market, and applicators must receive thorough training and follow label guidelines before they can apply pesticides. Farmers complying with FIFRA were never intended to be required to receive duplicate permits. It's like asking someone to have two driver's licenses in the same state. The stupid pesticide permit only adds cost and bureaucratic burden on the farmer, opens them up to citizen lawsuits, and there are no additional environmental benefits. A bill to correct this problem, H.R. 872, was recently passed in the House of Representatives, but we must ensure that this actually becomes law to protect farmers from this perversion of the Clean Water Act. And going forward, as Congress takes up environmental labor, food safety, and financial tax legislation, please be judicious in your consideration and hold our farm businesses harmless from overreaching policy. If my children choose to carry on as the fifth generation family farm to produce food, I hope that together that we can work to help make that happen. Thank you for your time to speak with you today. We appreciate your media attention and concrete actions to assist farm families. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. Mr. Teeple. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the concerns of the, the apple industry. My name is, is John Teeple. Uh, we are apple growers in Wayne County. We've been in business for over 50 years. I'm the third generation. I have two nephews who are going to be the fourth generation. Uh, we are also part owners of uh, uh, Lake Country Storage. It's uh, that's apple storage that involves 10 other farms. We store 1.5 million bushels of apples. We are also part owners of Empire Fruit Growers Co-op, uh, another farm co-op, and a packing facility. I've also served on the board of the New York Apple Association, and I'm currently on the U.S. Apple Board, sorry, U.S. Apple Association. On our farm, we, we have 12 full-time people, and uh, during the harvest season, we will ramp up to around 65 people. At our packing line and storage facilities, we, we employ uh, approximately 35 full-time people. I'd like to focus on, on two issues that I think uh, Mrs. Martin and Mr. Taylor have done a great job with uh, highlighting some of those already. And uh, Mrs. Martin talked about labor. Labor is probably the biggest issue for uh, fruits and vegetable farms in the United States. We need a reliable, legal labor, labor force in this country. The apple industry is, is a world market. We ship apples all over the United States as well as export apples to other countries. If we are to keep the apple industry in New York, we must remain competitive. 
New York State needs approximately 8,000 workers for about eight weeks to harvest the apple crop of 30 million bushels. We need a unique labor force to harvest, to harvest these apples. They must be physically fit. Picking apples is hard work. They must be dependable and able to work eight to nine hours per day, six days a week. Apples are very time sensitive and must be picked at the proper time. They must have the ability to spot pick apples for color and size and not to bruise them. So it's a specialized labor force. There's not many people that meet that criteria and are, are waiting for us to give them a job for eight weeks in the fall. And certainly not 8,000 when we need them. At the same time that we're starting the apple harvest, all the other apple related businesses are also gearing up the packing lines, the storages, the processing plants like Mott's. Most of our local people prefer these jobs as they're more long term, usually 45 to 50 weeks. So to, to meet our needs, we have to attract migrant labor workers from around the country. We do this by paying them well and giving them free housing. We pay by the piece rate, which equates to about 10 to 15 dollars per hour plus the value of free housing and utilities, which is worth another $3 per hour. Much of the employment documentation we are given at the time of hiring turns out later to be inadequate. This puts the employer in the position of having to terminate the employee and possibly face stiff fines. Or we have to use the offshore labor program, H-2A, which Mrs. Martin detailed very well. The H-2A program is administered by the Department of Labor it's very expensive, it's cumbersome, it's very restrictive as to the use of the workers, and it's unpredictable as to the timing of when we will receive our workers. We need agriculture labor reform in this country, something like the age jobs bill that has been introduced in the past. We need a legal migratory workforce that is willing and able to move where the crops need to be harvested. We are quickly approaching the turning point in this country if we are not allowed to import labor to harvest our fruits and vegetables we will be importing our fruits and vegetables my second point exports uh, are play a critical role in the economic vitality of the american apple industry promotion programs established under the farm bill help maintain and increase overseas apple sales under these programs, U.S. apple growers partner with U.S. Department of Agriculture to increase consumption of U.S. apples overseas. American apples are grown commercially in over 30 states. Our $2.2 billion crop is produced on approximately 350,000 acres of, of orchards. This means that over one in every three dollars in apple revenue comes from exports. Our overseas apple sales are critical to our orchards and the entire apple industry. The Market Access Program, referred to as MAP, and the Technical Assistance for Specialty Crops Program, and the Emergency Emerging Markets Program are part of the USDA's Farm Bill. The industry provides matching funds for the MAP program. These are good programs vital to our industry. I would urge your continued support for these programs in the new farm bill. I would welcome any questions that you have at this time. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you all very much. I think uh, I would like to start, and I'll yield myself five minutes for questions, um, because for many months now, really it's been a recurring theme from the dairy industry, from agriculture, from the apple industry. We need a reliable, legal, workforce. So maybe we could spend a little bit of time today having you tell us what what would that program look like? What what would a, a stable, reliable, legal workforce, what would that process look like and how can we help to achieve that? And we can start with uh, each one of you. I'd like to hear your comments. Um, I think agriculture is very different from most most other industries. We have, as Mr. Temple um, mentioned, um, we have a short period of time that we need workers. The feeling in the United States is that those workers 
um, are there because there is unemployment. But you're not going to get somebody to give up their unemployment, um, what they may make from unemployment to come to work on your farm for a short period of time. And the work is very, very hard. It's been documented. Um, I had workers last year, um, domestic workers, who came to us. And by domestic, we mean um, from the United States, not necessarily like a domestic worker in a home, who came to us and they lasted four hours, um, couldn't do the work. That's not necessarily going to be true, but because that is generally what happens, we need a program that allows me to bring workers in. The, uh, the H-2A program is the only legal program that I have available to me at this point. Uh, the federal government has, it, it's, it's not a well-run program. You can do one thing one year, and then the next year you do the same thing when you put in your applications and they'll turn it down. That's what's called a deficiency letter. And, it, and, it, and for no reason, we just had a conference call with um, Congresswoman Slaughter's office and the U.S. Department of Labor, and we tried to nail them down. Like you know, we got a deficiency letter because uh, we did not put, um, we didn't say why we needed more workers than in the year before, for example, and they just automatically threw it out. When we pointed that out to them, why did that happen? They said, well, you didn't tell us why. Well, we're on the form, does it ask us to tell you why? We just answered the questions on the form. And their answer was, well, there's no place on the form. You have to write a letter to us. Well, that kind of thing. And you're also given three days to get this done. So when you receive a deficiency letter, you have three days to correct it and get it back to them. It's an impossibility. Could I interrupt for a minute? Sure. So currently, when you, you file an application, and it has to be done every year, for the for the uh, temporary employees, and when you do that, is there a time frame at which the Department of Labor must must respond to you? Is there an expectation that within ten days or thirty days you're going to hear back with a determination? Is there any? There is a time frame, and there is an expectation. Um, we are held to the time frame. We are hopeful in our expectations of what's going to happen. The uh, U.S. Department of Labor does not respond consistently or fairly. That's the biggest part of the problem. We don't know. And in agriculture, when you have when you have a product or something that needs to be planted or harvested or cared for, and you count on your employees to be there and they hold you up for six weeks, everything on your farm has been planted. Everything has been ready to go, and they don't they for no good reason that we can figure it out, don't send you the workers um, and hold you up. You've got six weeks of something that you've probably just lost your entire. You're, well, there will be no profit that year, and there's no good reason and no explanation on their part. Thank you. Mr. Um, yeah, uh, dairy farms, uh, at the minimum, need inclusion into the H-2A program. Um, there have been bills in the past to try to do that. Um, we're, we do not qualify for H-2A at dairy farms. We need year-round labor. Um, even in times of high unemployment, um, in the last four years, we've had uh, three domestic workers come to the farm and ask for jobs. Uh, two high school young ladies are helping on the farm, taking those jobs, and are happy to have them. Uh, the other person was not uh, even remotely qualified. And that's kind of a misnomer with agriculture. A lot of times people feel these jobs are unskilled, that anybody can do them, and it's not true at all. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of technology involved. Uh, we need a skilled labor force, and, and regardless of pay, which is another misnomer, uh, a domestic labor does not want to take jobs on farms, unfortunately. So the challenge for us is to find a labor force, and uh, many times we turn to migrants for that. Uh, one, of the other, one of the other challenges you asked, what would it look like? Uh, we need a visa program, whatever you want to call it. Uh, a visa program, maybe a, a three-year visa that would have to be renewed for terms of three years. Um, we need to bring these people out of the shadows. Uh, unfortunately, the need for people to work here has been wrapped, rolled into the whole immigration discussion, and it, it almost seems like it will never be solved because there's so many factors with it. In agriculture, we need a visa program. Um, we can't send them all back at once. We simply <coughs> farms would have to shut down because they could not continue without a labor force. If you bring them in, make them pay a fine, uh, get a visa, the ones who do not come in those are the ones you need to chase. If there's an issue, the ones that don't come in are probably the ones you need to go after. So I would implore you to, to work for a visa program. Uh, at the very least, we need to pro improve H-2A. Um, Ms. Martin and Mr. Tebow have um, talked about that quite a bit. And uh, 
we need a stable, reliable workforce and a visa program. If we could get one in place and try to separate it from the immigration discussion, the, as a full package would help us tremendously. Thank you. Mr. Tiefel? Yeah, I would agree with uh, Mr. Taylor. A, a, a visa program to address the, the issue of the, the people that are here. Uh, you know, there's estimated 8 to 12 million undocumented workers here in the United States. Uh, I think we estimate approximately uh, 2 million work in agriculture. Um, these people uh, want to be uh, legal. They, they want to be able to come and work. They want to be able to go home. Uh, we've The current system has trapped them here. Uh, right now, they don't dare go home because they can't get back across the border. Uh, we, I agree, We when, and I think in agriculture, we agree that we want secure borders. Um, we need to make a, a, a provision for these people legally to be here. Uh, this, we had these eight to 12 million undocumented workers working here in the United States while we had almost full employment in this country. It's a, it's a different labor force than the labor force that's currently unemployed, um, especially for fruits and vegetables where we need this migratory labor force. The h 2 program works, sort of, but these people can't move around the country. If you have an H2A, H2A person come to your farm, they can only work for your farm for that specific purpose. They can't go to your neighbor if he needs help. Uh, most of our, a lot of our help migrate around the country. Uh, we, most of our uh, people are picking blueberries before they come and pick apples. That won't work under the H2A program. So we need, we need the, the H2A program uh, changed, and we need a visa program. So you're talking about having two separate programs when you say improve the H-2A or you know, have the visa or both? Both. 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 Okay. We need to address this population that's here. And the dairy industry has been excluded from the H-2A program because it's a year-round yes. because we can't. Yes, exactly. Uh, under H-2A, I believe the uh, maximum is 8 to 10 months that you are able to continuously stay here. I may be wrong on that, but it's 10 months, okay. And the dairy industry, we need uh, laborers year-round and continuous and it's uh, very difficult well it's not allowed but it would be very difficult if it was allowed under eight to, eight to ten month guideline it would have to be uh, allowed for year-round work thank you I yield to Mr. Kelly thank you Madam Chairman the, the question for all of you and it is this is what I'm that involved in it I don't know if you're here from the previous group I'm, I'm an automobile dealer by by trade uh, but my experience has been the people that come in to talk to me I've ne never had any experience in what it is that I do. And they've never actually done the job nor been involved with anything of that job. They may be very good with laptops, but when it comes to actually doing the job and understanding what it is, the challenges that you all go through, if you could, just, just help us with the people that you talk to. Any of them have any experience? Anybody ever sit down with you? And we have something in the oil industry called 20 groups. We get 20 people of like size in different areas of the country sit down and discuss common problems and come up with solutions that make sense. I would suggest that that's really where we seem to be dropping the ball here. I don't know anybody that I've ever talked to that's done an audit at my place that have any idea what it is that I do. So if you could, I mean, and you all want to earn it in agriculture for different parts of it. I think you're absolutely right. Um, most, of, most of the general public knows um, about farming from what they hear and what they hear is um, advocates, labor advocates, who have the funding to be out there and to stage things, uh, stage presentations on how bad farmers are. I think most people, my friends are, most of my friends are teachers, they're not in agriculture, and they look at me kind of really like if I have a, if I have a thought that's important, it's like, wow, you know. So it, you kind of have to overcome that a bit. Um, but the, the other thing is, no, I think most people think that we pay minimum wage or we try to pay less than minimum wage. That's not true. Um, the adverse effect wage rate, which is the required wage for an H-2A worker, is $10.65. I pick my workers up at their house in Mexico. I get their visas. I pay all their expenses up to my house. I pay for their, um, their food even while they travel. I provide free housing. Uh, take them to the store, take them to the doctors, whatever they need to, and that's in addition to, the, and then I send them home, and lately we've been flying them home because of the border problems in Mexico. Um, that's in addition to the $10.65 an hour that they earn here. That may not seem like a great deal in industry, but when you add in all the other things, it's really, 
it's really not a um, it's not a, an inexpensive wage for us to run our business, and it's not a cheap wage for the workers. So no, I don't think people do know what we do, um, and we're really too busy doing what we do to get ourselves out there and share that. So something like this is important. We also lobby in in uh, Washington D.C. and in Albany. This is a, a very interesting question for us because it uh, really hits uh, home uh, in Congresswoman Berkeley district, especially now we're dealing, uh, especially on environmental issues. Uh, the far, uh, the non-farm community at large doesn't understand what we do and why we need to do it, and, and the amount of regulation that we're under. Um, we have individuals in some com communities here who have uh, tried to make people believe that uh, we are bad and that all we want to do is pollute the environment, which nothing else could be further from the truth. Um, particularly in Wayne County now, we've been dealing with a group of three or four people that have uh, spent a lot of time, have a lot of time, um, sending this, bat, this message against the agriculture. Um, a number of us in the ag community have stepped up and tried to hold uh, community meetings to educate them. We brought in people from Cornell. Uh, this Saturday, we just had a tour on 8,000 cow dairy to talk about methane digesters and other things, and to really try to educate the non-farm public about what farms are doing to protect the environment, which is a tremendous amount. And yet we still um, have people with ideas that um, we aren't doing anything. Um, one thing that I did talk about was the Chesapeake, uh, Chesapeake Bay. One interesting uh, fact about that, New York is far and above a lot of other states in the country and its environmental protection, and we're thankful for that, and farmers have worked to embrace that. Uh, we have medium-sized CAFOs, while other states do not, as well as large CAFOs based on size. Uh, the U.S. Geographical Survey, just inside Pennsylvania, shows us that the water leaving New York is clean. And if it were the same water that reached the bay, the bay would not be impaired, and we would not be facing this, this uh, Chesapeake Bay cleanup. So we've always tried to point out to people, you know, we are doing everything we can, but sometimes it's a, a very difficult message for us to get through and get people to understand. And if we're going to grow food in this country, and we have a tremendous ability to grow food in this country, um, you know, globally in less than 40 years, we have to increase our food production globally by 40%. And that's the way we need to look at our food production is globally. There'll be over 9 billion people on the planet, and how are we going to do it? This country is positioned to do that. We're environmentally sound, we have good management practices, we produce a high quality product, and it's safely done. Other countries like China, Mexico, and Brazil, if we don't do it, they're going to do it for us. And they will feed the world, and I don't think we want that. So we have a number of, we certainly do have a number of challenges of getting people to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, and the need for us to be able to do it. You can't move my farm to China, but China will do the job for us. So I think it would be better for us, suited for us, to realize that we can protect, protect the environment and produce a high quality product. 98% uh, of the farms in America are family owned farms. You know, we're, we have uh, our children, our relatives, we're working on our farms, we're concerned about our farms, and concerned about the, the land, we're good stewards of the land. Um, we seem to be labeled as corporate farms uh, most of us are corporations for business reasons, uh, but doesn't mean that we're, we're still not family farms. We, you know, I think, as I pointed out in my testimony, I think we're, we're going to be reaching a point uh, with high labor um, farming in the fruits and vegetables that either we, we uh, import this labor to, to harvest these crops or we will be importing our food. You know, we can go the same way that the garment industry did in this country. Uh, in the Northeast, we used to have a lot of garment uh, factories. It didn't just all disappear overnight. Uh, slowly, uh, they started moving. The same thing is happening right now with, with uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, in the California area, that, that's very easy to cross the border and, and have that uh, produced in Mexico, and it's happening now. Uh, I don't think in this country that, that we want to uh, give up our production of food, and especially on, on fruits and vegetables. But do you have a chance, I mean, the people that come to see you, do you ever have a chance to review with them, or do they have any idea before they come there what it is that you do? That's my, I, my whole concern is most of the people I've talked to in these agencies and bureaucracies never have done the job that they're trying to, to regulate, and that's scary to me. It, it is scary, and most of them have no clue. I might, I just have a couple more.
more questions I want to flesh through a little bit more in this labor issue because it seems to be something that just oh, I've heard about and, and is a big issue. In New York State, we've lost so much industry, and we are uh, fortunate to have agriculture and dairy farming, the industries, that's one of the leading industries in this state. So we need to work hard to uh, ensure your success. And as we talked about in the previous panel, to get the government out of the way so you can do what you know how to do and what you do best. Um, regarding um, the, the, the labor issue, what, why, what are you hearing as the impediments? Why can't this be streamlined? The Department of Labor, or who you've talked to, what is the impediment? Why won't they talk about reforming the process so you can get people here reliably, get them back home when, when the season is over with, um, and, and, and get what you need uh, rather than the situation as it is? What are the obstacles? What are, what are you hearing? It's a, it's a huge problem, it's a, and we're talking comprehensive immigration, and it becomes larger. It's like the comprehensive health care plan, and, and we've seen all the concerns around that. Immigration is probably uh, uh, larger than the health care plan as far as its, its issues. Uh, and because of that, it's difficult to tackle, and with uh, high unemployment, it's politically poisoned to talk about bringing in foreign workers. Um, you know, we, I, maybe we need to uh, divide it up in pieces and work at it in smaller pieces. I, I heard testimony, though, that the, the folks you bring in to work don't want to stay here. They want to go back home and then come back when it's time to work again. Is that is that your experience? There, there's some of both. There's some of both. Well, a lot of the uh, uh, younger fellas come to work and, and would like to go home. Usually in the apple industry, just speaking for apples, these folks have worked in other areas of the country, um, working with sweet corn in some places, uh, watermelon, peppers, and, and blueberries, and, and apples are about the end of the crop. Uh, we finish uh, the first, second week in November. A lot of them like to go home for Christmas. Uh, a lot of them don't dare. I, I think your question of what what needs to be done to be fixed, that, um, that's the, the big question. We don't know. Uh, we don't know why the impediments are there. It gets worse and worse every year. Our feeling um, as farmers is that they want to do away with the H-2A program. And also our feeling as farmers is that is the only legal option we have to get good legal workers here. We're trying to work within the system. Um, immigration, if, if you took immigration aside and, and didn't even deal with immigration, we're just asking for a legal workforce. Any way we can do it. The impediments that the federal government is putting out there to us make no sense. There's no reason. And we actually asked, I personally asked the Department of Labor, the US Department of Labor, um, give me the name of someone that I can contact when I have a question. I had trouble between the State Department of Labor and the Federal Department of Labor. Just give me a name so that I don't have to just keep trying to work my way up to an answer. And their answer to me um, was well, on our website, we have a box that says help and you click the box, and then you'll get help. Well, it doesn't work. Um, in, a, in an ideal world, it would work, but there's no one there who really is answering, and there's no one who wants to say, my name is so-and-so, and I am going to give you this answer. I think that may be the way the agencies work, but we have no answers, and that's what we'd like to get to the bottom of. Just give us a program that works. Make the program work. Have, have your uh, agents, your organizations, have you put together some piece of legislation or some kind of your dream piece of legislation? Have you begun to, to put together what a good uh, H-2A program would look like? And could we, you know, could we get that from you so we can begin to look at this process that would work? I think you're right. Maybe the, the issue is to break it down and not look at immigration like this, but look at a, a legal safe work program as, as a small piece. So the eight jobs bill that has been introduced a number of times in the past addresses the H-2A program and the visa program. Uh, a good piece of legislation, but just doesn't garner enough support to, to move through Congress. Yeah, I know New York Farm Bureau has made several attempts to, to make changes to H-2A and to push for ag jobs and other things. And uh, unfortunately, we have, we have not been able to get things to move through. And you asked us, some of the, um, the things you, that we've seen that have been impediments to this, um, one example of something in H-2A that is really absurd 
uh, workers are required to apply online in their home country. Most countries that these workers are coming from, to find a computer and then to understand how to use one is, 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 is impractical. So farms are actually paying people to go down there to get fine workers, help them apply online for the, for the H-2A program to get them here. And, and, it's, and it's things like that. We have a, a fruit and vegetable grower in Ontario County um, that the weight too, you have to start earlier and earlier in this process every year. He puts in, he's one of the largest cabbage growers in the state. And uh, two years ago, his workers were supposed to be arrived on May 15th. June 15th, he still didn't have workers. By the time he was full cabbage planting time, he had help from his neighbors and friends and other farms. Literally, he had over 90 people on the payroll in one week just to plant cabbage. He had no workers under H-2A until July 15th. Uh, there's horror story after horror story like that. And we need, if, if this is the program we're gonna use, we need to have it standardized. We need to make some changes to it. And the other issue is the, the rules have changed several times in the last five years. Uh, we had what we called Bush rules, then President Obama came in, then we had the Obama rules, then there were lawsuits, that was upheld. We're gonna stay with the Bush rules for a while, now we're back to the Obama rules. So this constant flux and, and no improvements to the program is not helping us at all. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah, I had one last question, and I think, Ms. Martin, you talked about it. There, because there's a, a, a feeling out there that when we say what the minimum wage is, people right in their, in their mind look at what the established federal wages are, in your case, maybe it's New York State. It has actually nothing to do with the effect of the minimum wage, which is driven by the region that you work in. And, and, it, and, and it's the total wage that you pay, because you start, I think you said, it was 10 to $15 an hour, plus transportation, plus food, plus lodging, plus, plus, plus. So your minimum wage, your effective minimum wage, is the total, the cumulative value or amount that you spend. And I think that, and one of the things we're finding out when we have all these hearings, and I don't mean this in any way to be disrespectful, the American people, if you were to ask them where milk comes from, it's from the grocery store. Uh, and I don't, and I, because that's the way we've grown up. But when it comes time to talk about what we have to pay people, and this is the thing I think that bothers me because people say they're only minimum wage jobs. Nobody has any idea of what a minimum wage actually means to an employer. So if each of you could tell me what's your effective minimum wage. It's not what the posted minimum wage is because I can't hire anybody of that in my area. I've got to pay them much more than that. If you could just maybe talk just, just a tiny bit about that because I think it's important for folks to understand what that, what that dollar amount actually is. Well, as I mentioned on the H-2A program, it's called an adverse effect wage rate. That is set by the government, um, and that right now is 10.25 an hour. Um, our average workers, um, I would I would say we have a we have what's a cabbage line. We have processing. I think the minimum that if you and they all receive um, free housing too. So I would say that normally you we on a farm you're probably paying. Um, for a part-time worker, you're probably paying 12, and probably, and some of our supervisors, uh, you're probably paying, and they get houses. I mean, these are not small little places. So if you figure that in, they're probably getting $30 an hour. I mean, some of our, our supervisors who started out as a migrant laborer are uh, making about $72,000 a year, and that is before you get to their housing, before you get to all the things that farms do. I don't think, I don't think that's, um, I don't think that's out of line with what other people pay, but because we aren't out there speaking for ourselves, and, and actually we've learned in agriculture that you have to fly a little bit low the, below the radar. That's unfortunate. I want to stand up and I want to say, hey, look, I'm proud to be a farmer, and this is what we do, and this is what we do in our community, but I can't, I can't say it. Um, even in, in church, I have to listen while we're taking up a collection for the poor migrant farm workers, and I'm like, I write their check every week. I know what these poor migrant farm workers are making. Let's let's build a little bit of self-esteem in there uh, for them also. They're hard workers. They work harder than the most Americans I've had on my farm. So I th I think that they are, are well paid, and I think that they're their extended family. I don't think they get the credit that they deserve, and I think we are we are blacklisted as um, the employers who like to keep people down. Uh, on our operation, uh, the, wa the wage rate is from eight to sixteen dollars an hour, and that also does not include housing. So it's a, it's a uh, different for everybody at their skill level and their and their time in agriculture, and um, 
so that so there's a varying scale for us. And also, I'd like to you know one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot. Um, people think that we set the wage rate as employers, and nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the employees set the wage rate. They know what their it's job. Market, is it's market right. driven. Yeah, it's market driven. Sure. They know what their job. They, we like to say they speak with their feet. If you don't pay them enough, and they're good workers, they're going to go somewhere else and find another job. I think mean, excellent point. Uh, people aren't staying on our farms. We're not forcing them to stay. They can go any place they want to. You know, our, on our farm, uh, we pay by the piece rate, which most apple picking is done by the piece rate. Uh, people aren't picking apples for minimum wage. It's hard work. Uh, these people want to make some money, and they're making our on our farm. Uh, the minimum would be ten dollars an hour. Most of our people are making twelve to fifteen dollars an hour, and receiving free housing and utilities, which I figured is a, is worth about another three dollars per hour. And I, and I think this is the problem, right? because we talk about domestic uh, workforce that doesn't want to do these jobs because they're minimum wage jobs. Just because it's posted at 7 25 an hour, that's not what you pay. You pay what the market in your area demands that you pay. And, and I think that's, I mean, we, we've got a huge problem in our country, branding it for what it is and marketing for what it is and getting the reach and frequency out there. Because when I talk to people, say, I, I won't work for 70, 20, 725 an hour. I said, you know what? Not only you, but nobody else I've ever hired will work for that. So I'm on board with you. But I, I, you know, we have an uphill battle with this because minimum wage is certainly not the way it's being played out. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, we want to uh, thank you for the hard work, uh, all three of the industries that have been represented here today present uh, years and generations of hard work and commitment, and we want to thank you for that. Thank you for what you bring to uh, the upstate economy and to the state of New York, and we look forward to working with you to try to resolve some of these problems, and thank you so much for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.